So I have to start by admitting that I think atmospheric particles or aerosols are one of the most important and interesting topics in air pollution. I am a little biased because I spent a number of years studying desert dust, wind erosion, production of mineral aerosols, and ultimately the deposition of these particles into faraway alpine settings. But regardless, atmospheric aerosols are really important. They affect the climate, they affect atmospheric chemistry, and they affect human health. They're also regulated under the Clean Air Act. And so in this video, we'll take a deeper look at where particles come from, why we call them what we call them, and uh, what they do um, in the atmosphere and ultimately in the environment. Atmospheric particles, otherwise known as aerosols, are a pretty complicated type of air pollution. So in this video, I'm going to walk through the definitions and explain how those definitions for particles relate to the size distribution of these materials in the atmosphere. We'll also talk a little bit about the composition of the particles and start to discuss how this might impact human health. We'll then talk about where particles come from and how that source profile affects their chemical composition. And lastly, we'll talk about how air quality regulations are designed to address particle pollution and look at whether or not they're being effective at doing this. One of the unusual aspects of atmospheric aerosols is that they're defined by their size. And this is really different than other forms of, of atmospheric pollutants. There are a couple of reasons for this, including the health impacts, which are highest for the smallest particles, and because size also corresponds to the broad source of the particles, and in a general sense to whether or not they're industrial or natural. The particle sizes we talk about start with PM2.5. This group is made of particles that are less than 2.5 microns in aerodynamic diameter, which is something like the actual diameter of the particle, but not exactly the same. These particles are mostly produced as a result of industrial activity and contain a set of chemicals that are byproducts of atmospheric reactions, including ammonium sulfate or ammonium nitrate. These particles include organic carbon-based materials, some elemental carbon materials, and some crustal materials that are derived from soils. Sometimes we call this dust. We'll talk more about these different types of chemicals on the next slide. PM10 includes particles that are between 2.5 and 10 microns in diameter, and these particles can include some nitrates and sulfates, but also start to include more materials that come from natural sources like dust, sea salts, bioaerosols, which include things like small pollen grains, as well as some complicated mixed materials with a range of different chemical compositions. PM2.5 and PM10 are the regulated particle categories in the United States and most other countries with air quality regulations. There are also unregulated particles in the atmosphere that are larger and include things like blowing dust or pollens. If you live in a dry part of the country, you'll be very familiar with these types of particles. And lastly, for reference, a human hair has a size diameter of somewhere between 17 and 200 microns, so that should give you a little bit of a sense for how small some of these particles are. So for each of these particle size classes, let's talk a little bit more about where they come from. For the PM2.5 particles, the major sources are vehicles, um, which release nitrogen oxides, volatile organic carbon, and particulate forms of carbon. These small particles also have sources in the organic compounds that are released from some industrial activities. I'll give you some more examples on the next slide. The PM10 sources include the erosion of soils from deserts or from agricultural systems in usual cases. Um, they also include emissions of sea salts from aerosols that are formed over the oceans or when waves break and also from some industrial sources that release gas or particles that become aerosols in the atmosphere. Lastly, that big class is mostly the result of soil erosion or from the release of plant materials like pollens into the atmosphere. If we take a closer look at the industrial aerosols, we can see a diverse array of sources, and this is only part of where these um, compounds can come from. The big thing about industrial aerosols is that the composition can be very complex and also very dangerous when these particles are inhaled into your lungs. We'll talk more about health impacts in a different video, but this group would be one of the most dangerous categories of air pollution in industrialized countries, this group called PM2.5. The big sources of industrial aerosols are vehicle emissions, industrial emissions, and emissions from energy production, and especially from coal combustion. Vehicles are outfitted with a range of pollution control measures that help reduce both gas and particle emissions. But when you drive behind a diesel truck, you know that different vehicles have different emission profiles. And in general, diesel vehicles have much higher particle release than gas-fired vehicles. 
This is because diesel combusts to leave behind tiny particle residues made up of organic materials. Those also are quite dangerous when inhaled. There's a whole range of industrial emissions that vary with the type of industry that we talk about. The photo here is from a plant that is producing different products from petroleum, and there are almost guaranteed to be some emissions of organic gases and probably some particles from these types of activities. These gases then react in the atmosphere to produce aerosols, or the aerosols react further to create a different type of aerosol. I mention coal specifically here because coal is by far the most polluting fossil energy source, and one of the major sources of pollution from coal are particles. Coal contains sulfur, and when this is emitted, it forms sulfate that react with other molecules like ammonium to create an ammonium sulfate aerosol in the atmosphere. Coal also produces organic byproducts like soot, same as diesel in a way, but this varies a lot and the emissions vary a lot depending on both the type of coal and the pollution controls that are in effect on a plant. The so-called natural aerosols include desert dust, which comes from the erosion of soils but which can also be heavily impacted by human use of landscapes and drought. So natural is sort of a term about where it's coming from and not whether or not it's affected by human activity. I'll talk more about this on the next slide. Marine aerosols are made up mostly of salts with a little bit of organic material mixed in. These are natural and they're also largely unchanged by human activity. Wildfire is a natural source of aerosols, um, but it can be a really important one, especially in 2020 with all the fires burning across the United States. As I talked about in another video, wildfire activity in the U.S. has increased as a result of droughts and dryness that is leaked to climate change. So while wildfire is natural, it is also influenced by human activity. One of the most interesting research studies I've ever done was up in the high Colorado alpine areas of the San Juan Mountains. We collected lake sediments from very high elevation lakes and then used a range of different techniques to show that these sediments actually are largely produced from dust that is deposited out of the atmosphere into the lake basins. So these are atmospheric aerosols that are turned into lake sediment. We then looked at the rate of sediment accumulation and were able to show a massive increase in the emission of dust right after the railroads were first put into the western United States. And then sheep and cattle were introduced to the western rangelands. This resulted in a massive loss of soil due to erosion from deserts in Utah and elsewhere in the west and resulted eventually in the Taylor Grazing Act of 1934 which put the Bureau of Land Management in charge of desert grazing regulation, in part because of the many ecological impacts of soil erosion. This process of development has actually been repeated in many parts of the world, and we've done work in a range of mountains in different parts of the world showing that the dust actually changes in the same way in different continents, and that it also affects the way that alpine lakes function. Um, the loss of dust from deserts also has impacts for how the ecology of the deserts that get disturbed in the first place. Wildfire is a major source of aerosols, as I talked about on an earlier slide, and the 2020 fire season was one of the worst on record. This graph is from a National Public Radio article with a link that is embedded here. The preliminary work from 2020 suggests a massive increase in the number of people in the United States that have been exposed to poor air quality, mostly because of the 2020 wildfire season. In fact, the worst air on the planet was on the west coast of the United States in September 2020. And as you can see in this graph, the concentration of PM 2.5 went off the charts for a part of Oregon that would normally have very clean air. These are the types of numbers that are typically only seen in places like Beijing, China. Wildfire smoke contains a lot of PM2.5 and also a lot of nitrogen oxide, which reacts in the atmosphere to produce ozone. So for a variety of reasons, this is a really important atmospheric pollutant source. In this video, you can see a fire burning just outside of Boulder, Colorado in October 2020. This will give you an idea of just how much material is produced during a wildfire. The list on the right is an example of some of the compounds that are produced in wildfires, and as you can see there are quite a lot of chemicals released, including some like benzene that are carcinogenic. And this is one of the reasons why wildfire smoke is so dangerous to human health. In the United States and in most other industrialized countries, particulate regulations focus on two groups, the PM2.5 and the PM10 groups. Most of the monitoring that we do in the U.S. is in urban areas, and the national average concentrations are shown in these two graphs. So as you can see nationally, we have seen sustained declines in PM concentrations over the last few decades. But right now, the national data only go to 2018, so we'll see what happens after this big wildfire year. 
In some places, and especially in Europe, there is now a discussion about making an additional standard for particles that are smaller than one micron in diameter, mostly because these particles are looking like they're very dangerous to human health and may need additional regulation. To summarize, atmospheric particles are separated into different size classes, and then they're regulated as PM2.5 and PM10. Anything bigger than that, that is assumed to be natural and is not regulated. There are many different natural and industrial sources of particles with a really complex mix of chemical compositions that are related to the way that they're produced. And this is one reason we just use these size categories rather than something more complicated. As I just noted, U.S. regulations focus on PM2.5 and PM10, and overall concentrations in these categories have been declining nationally for the last few decades. But of course, the 2020 fire season has pushed up concentrations in some parts of the country pretty dramatically.